Hi, welcome to Exploring the Illusion of Free Will. My name is George, and today we're going to be exploring how the hedonic imperative makes free will impossible. Okay, um, before we do that, you know, I just want to review the basic um, purpose of this show. It's the, the idea is that we've, we've had this illusion of free will for centuries, millennia, and the hope is that by overcoming it, by transcending it, we can create a better world, a world that's more understanding. Um, because what happens is when we believe we have a free will, then when other people do things that are wrong, we'll blame them and, uh, and consider that they deserve to be punished. And when we do things wrong, we'll, cons you know, we'll feel guilty and we'll feel the pain of guilt. And um, naturally, understanding that we don't have a free will isn't license for us to just do whatever we want because ultimately we're not responsible for what we do. Um, you know, because, you know, we, we, we need to, to kind of like, kind of hold ourselves accountable in a certain way. But, you know, if we, if we do it from a causal will rather than a free will perspective, it would be a, a kinder world. Um, okay, if, these shows are going to be online, so if you don't catch, if, if you'd like to see them again, just go to causalconsciousness.com. Okay, and, uh, and again, before I get into the basic theme of today's show, I just want to review what we generally mean when we say that uh, we have a free will, what the illusion of free will is. Basically, when people say that they have a free will, it's, they mean that they can choose whatever they want, that nothing is compelling their choice, that their choice is completely up to them. And, for example, in the area of, of morality, that's where it's, you know, extremely important. That means, like, if something, if somebody does something right, for example, then they deserve the credit, you know, um, that they, it was, it was them that did it, and, you know, it's completely their doing, and they deserve credit. And this is kind of interesting, because, like, in, in theology, um, at least in Judeo-Christian, and I think probably Islamic theology, we tend to have the idea that when we do things right, we actually should feel grateful that, um, that it's actually God that, that deserves the credit, and which is a right interpretation, you know, from the theological perspective. But, um, you know, and when we do wrong, it's, it's, um, it would be our fault, whatever. But uh, so I, that's the idea. The idea, the idea is that, um, f that the term free will means that, that in moral decisions, when we do something right or wrong, it's completely up to us. And, and the problem is that, like, with a moral decision, if we, if, let's say, if, if we ourselves do something wrong, then um, if we don't recognize that we were completely compelled to do it, that it really wasn't our decision, we're going to punish ourselves. You know, um, we're going to say to ourselves, well, I deserve to feel pain. And so naturally, a lot of the show is about um, kind of like, transcending the illusion of free will so we are more understanding towards ourselves and others. So, um, so a proper understanding of reality will lead to a kinder world. Um, and naturally, um, the reality is, you know, that um, or all of our choices are causal. We don't have a free will, we have a causal will. Okay, and you know, what causes our decisions, our, our actions, our moral actions are can generally be described as the past. What's happened in the past causes what happens in the present, and what happens in the present causes what happens in, in the future. This is, it's the basic principle of causality, cause and effect, which governs the entire universe, and so naturally it must govern our human will. So, so these are the terms. These, these are like, this is what the debate has been about. And, you know, it's interesting because uh, this issue has been debated since the time of the Greeks. And in all that time, there's never been any convincing evidence that we have a free will. You know, some people claim that, um, that well, of course we have a free will. Uh, we experience ourselves as having a free will. But, you know, the reality is that, no, we don't really experience having a free will. We experience having a will. You know, that we don't experience having a, a will that's free f of the past, that's free of how we were raised, what we learned, what we didn't learn, our genetic makeup, our personality, our unconscious. You know, these, these factors that, that come together to actually decide for us what we do. 
All right, so and one of these, one of these factors is um, what I've coined the hedonic imperative. Um, actually, this is, um, it's, um, it's really like a pleasure principle. It's like Freud's pleasure principle, like, like a basic um, principle in science, in biology, in um, psychology, that we as human beings are hardwired to seek pleasure and avoid pain. Okay, that's what we do, you know, <laughs> through every moment of our lives. We, when we make a decision, it's based on the prediction that that decision is going to result in the greatest pleasure to us, either immediately or in the future, or is going to minimize, you know, any kind of pain we might feel. And so, so the idea is that we're completely programmed in this way. That's, you know, for example, if we were a computer, that would be the, the software. That would be how we would program. We have to, you know, the computer has to do what its program tells it to do. It, it doesn't have a choice. And it's the same with us. We are programmed. We have no choice but to seek pleasure and avoid pain. Okay, so naturally, what happens if, if, we're, if, if, every, if every decision that we make is based on this hedonic imperative, this, this hardwired compulsion and programming to do and think and feel what we predict is going to result in the greatest pleasure or the least pain, then how could that decision be free? You know, how could that decision be up to us? That's the key. You know, it's really, um, you know, for example, if, if a computer is, let's say a robot is, is programmed to make, let's say, a left turn every time it comes to a, a wall or some kind of obstacle, then you certainly wouldn't, you know, say that that robot had a free will. You know, it's doing what it's programmed to do. You know, it can't do otherwise. It can't, you know, it has to do what it's programmed. Again, we, we human beings are programmed biologically, genetically, to seek pleasure and avoid pain. Now, all right, some people might raise the objection, well, you know, there are times when we could do what's most pleasant or what's pleasant, but we, we actually choose to do what's, um, what, what's going to create more pain. And, and that's true. It's true, but that's really that, um, well, I mean, it's true in a sense, but what happens in those, sense, in those cases, for example, we have a conscience. Okay, we have a conscience that, um, that needs to do what we consider right. So, like, let's say um, this, you know, I'm taping this show while the Libyan um, revolution is taking place. Okay, and there are many Libyan citizens. They're going out into the streets, risking their lives, getting killed um, for the greater good to, to establish democracy in Libya. Okay, so what happens is, like, the pain that they would feel by not fighting for, um, by not risking their lives for this democracy, for, you know, the freedom of self-determination, you know, freedom from, from Gaddafi as, as a dictator, a very cruel dictator, the pain they would feel by not doing um, something about that would, um, would be um, more, apparently, than the pain of, 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 of getting, you know, shot by a bullet or, 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 or even uh, losing their life. You know, that's what our conscience is about. Um, there are other examples of this. Sometimes, like, as parents, we will sacrifice, we will, um, we will just work very hard, you know, like, especially, like, um, mothers with infants, you know, they're, um, the, the, the infant has to be constantly attended to. They can't, you know, they're conscious conscience won't allow them to just simply do what they want and seek their own pleasure because, um, well, because of love for their, their child. So, so um, basically, they will choose to, to, um, to undergo the pain of, of being very attentive to the child, of, of just like sacrificing their own pleasure for the health and benefit of the child. But again, that's, that's really, um, it's a satisfaction of 
of their of the demand of their conscience because uh, we're going to go into this in more detail but the hedonic imperative isn't the only program the only hardwired reason why free will is impossible uh, we also have a moral imperative in other words like and it's it's related to the to the hedonic um, in, uh, imperative in the sense that like we're hardwired to always do what we consider to be right and um, again the first thing that might come up when you consider that well is some people know that they're doing something wrong and they do it anyhow but when you really think about it you know in their mind at the time that they do that they're justifying it in that way like for example let's say um, an employee steals from a company you know part of them says well I know I'm doing something wrong but another part says well this company has been stealing from you know the employees and been doing a lot of wrong things so you know there's always a justification right or wrong um, okay so again like there are many there are many ways of understanding why free will is impossible why we simply just don't have free wills but uh, like for example simple cause and effect you know causality like like the fact that we have an unconscious you know that's always at work and always like you know always taking part in, in our decisions and that's something I you know I'm gonna do shows about you know to just describe this in great in great detail but there have been experiments where for example uh, subjects have been primed you know um, primed meaning have been led through a certain exercise to um, to think in a certain way and then they make a decision and then they're asked why they make the decision and they give an answer but that answer has no relation to the priming in other words they they're they're just guessing the why they did it and they're they're guessing wrongly it's really you know they're it's um, they're un um, they're not conscious of of how the priming that was done by the experimenters actually led to what um, you know their behavior so so again there there are various different ways to understand why free will is impossible but but when you consider you can leave leave all all those other um, factors aside just the the um, the idea that there is hedonic this hedonic imperative um, completely um, describes the you know the reason why free will is impossible again let me let me review if we um, if we're programmed to always seek pleasure and always seek goodness I mean we can bring that into it also um, we have to do that we have no choice you know if you know if we're given a uh, choice between two foods an apple and um, a pizza okay um, for example let's say I was given that choice um, I've, I've become a vegan you know I, I, I can't conscience the way we treat farm animals I can't countenance it it's it's just cruel it's inhumane so so my conscience is leading me to, to not eat um, animal products you know dairy products meat whatever so like so naturally if, if I'm given that choice I'm not gonna I like you know I would prefer part of me would prefer a pizza because it might taste better than the apple or you know for whatever reason but but my conscience you know I, I I have more pleasure in satisfying my conscience than in satisfying my taste my taste for foods so again it's always it's always like it's a lot of times and with, with that example you know we have um, a case of competing pleasures so so it's not just that we're always compelled to seek pleasure we're also compelled to seek the most pleasant of, of various options um, and think about this think about this if we had a free will <laughs> if we had a free will if people had free wills everybody on the planet would be entirely blissed out every moment of every day um, a free will by definition means that we can think whatever we want regardless of the weather regardless of what's been happening what has happened what will happen you know regardless of anything our decisions are completely up to us our 
feelings are completely up to us. That's, that's what the doctrine of free will teaches, you know, that, that, you know, what we think, feel, and do is completely up to us. So, I mean, we're, um, we're again, we're hardwired to always seek pleasure. But um, many, many times we're, we're not successful at that. Think about it. If we had a free will, um, who among us wouldn't choose to think completely blissful thoughts all the time and to feel completely blissful feelings all the time? You know, that, it, it's so clear. It's so obvious. You know, that's what we would do. If we would have a free will, like St. Paul discovered, um, in, in Romans, writing in Romans, if we had a free will, we would do good all the time. You know, when we're confronted with a moral decision, we would never yield to temptation. We would never yield to, to our, our emotions that might be driving us to, to make the wrong decision. Um, so that, that's a very good way to understand how, um, how this hedonic imperative um, just makes free will impossible. Just, just considering that, um, that if we really did have a free will, um, that would mean that our, our feelings would be completely up to us. And naturally, again, who, who would choose to, um, to, to feel a negative feeling in that case? Okay. Um, there are, as I was saying, um, other imperatives, other kinds of programming that, that we're hardwired for, you know, like the pleasure um, imperative, like the hedonic, um, like the uh, moral imperative. Okay, for example, um, we have a reason imperative, and that, it, and it kind of goes along with the pleasure with the hedonic imperative in the sense that, like, we what we consider when we're making a decision to be the most reasonable of two or, or more options, it gives us pleasure to be reasonable. But, but the idea is like, for example, if we're, if we're trying to transfer one liquid from, you know, one container to, to one of two other containers, and, um, and one of the containers may not hold the liquid, may not be large enough to hold the liquid, and we're naturally not going to choose to pour the, the liquid into that container. Um, because it, because it, it, it wouldn't make sense to it. It, it just would, um, you know, oppose our, our, our logic, our reason in the case. So naturally, we're, we're always, we always do what we consider to, to be the most reasonable. Now, <laughs> um, sometimes we do what's unreasonable because um, it's not just reason that that compels. I mean, this basically what I'm trying to describe is like there are so many factors that prohibit free will, that make free will impossible. So like, let's say we're trying to be reasonable about something, but um, let's say our emotions kick in. We all, we all have had experiences, for example, when we're discussing something with someone, someone we may love, someone we may care very much about, and we're trying to be reasonable, and they're trying to be reasonable, but then these emotions kick in, anger, fear, whatever. And then, all of a sudden, you know, we're trying to be reasonable, we can't, because, like, we're, we're like, the reason is overrided by this strong emotional component. So, actually, you know, that's, that's another imperative, the emotional imperative. We, we are driven by our most compelling emotions. Um, okay, another, another imperative is like the survival imperative, um, the survival instinct. You know, we're going we're gonna to choose to do what we do um, based on our consideration of what is going to um, lead to our greatest chance of survival. You know, we all have that instinct. All animals have that. And, and again, if, 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 we're, if we're compelled, if every decision we make is in part based on that. And again, sometimes there are exceptions, like well, there's the case of a martyr, you know, like these the demonstrators in Libya who are giving their lives um, because, of, because of the moral imperative. It's like some, sometimes these, these imperatives 
will compete with each other. And that's why the title of the show is The Hedonic Imperative, to demonstrate that they all serve the, the, the idea of, of pleasure, of um, seeking pleasure and avoiding pain. In other words, for, for one person, it might be more important to please their conscience of, of, you know, by demonstrating and risking death in Libya than to, than to survive and, you know, and just like have their conscience um, pain them in that way. So, and, and the last, um, and uh, there are probably others, but an, another one is the, the procreative imperative, just the idea um, that we have a, a drive to reproduce, you know, to, to um, propagate our species and all. So, okay, so, so basically we have an understanding of, of why, you know, if we're seeking pleasure, if we're seeking goodness, if we're seeking to be reasonable, if we, if we have these imperatives, but especially the, the, the hedonic imperative, the, 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 um, the motivation, the basic drive to seek pleasure, then, um, you know, our wills are not free. Our wills are not free of that imperative. We have to seek pleasure. We have to avoid pain. We have no choice in it. Um, and, you know, um, again, why is this important? Well, um, you know, we, we live in a world where our entire civilization is founded on an illusion. You know, our criminal justice system, for example, you have um, people who have spent years in, in jail or prison um, for things that they had absolutely no choice but to do. You know, you have, you have people who, who may not want to fund our education system because they say, well, you know, people have a free will. You might educate a kid all their life, but at the time they have to make a decision as an adult, that education isn't going to mean anything because of the free will, because they can choose whatever they want. Um, you know, they're, they're just, in our everyday lives, you know, we... Um, we have interactions with other people. And if, if we don't recognize that they are compelled to do whatever they do, that they, you know, they're going to do whatever they feel is either the most right or the most pleasant or the most reasonable, and they have no choice in it, you know, it's not, the, the choice is not up to them at all, then um, we're going to be more understanding of them. We're not going to blame them. We're not going to... Um, we're not going to say to, to ourselves, they deserve punishment. A good example of this is like, you know, with what's happening in Libya right now, um, Gaddafi has killed um, probably over a thousand um, civilians, most of them unarmed. And um, the general tendency is to, 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 to hate the, the person, you know, to, to hold him responsible and hate him. Now, personally, I, you know, I who, um, who understand that um, that Gaddafi is simply doing what he considers to be the most right and what's going to bring him the most pleasure. I mean, he, he's completely delusional, but in his mind, he thinks he's, you know, doing something right, whatever. Um, I, I can't, you know, from a causal perspective, I can't blame him. I can't assign blame to him. But at the same time, um, my conscience won't allow me to... Um, to kind of like let him off the hook, to not in a certain sense hold him responsible. So, so what I say to myself is, well, you know, God willing, you know, our, our military or the Libyans will, will stop him somehow. It'd be, it'd be ideal, it'd be the best if he just stepped down. But if, if he doesn't, then to kill him, to simply just like assassinate him or ter terminate him in some way would be justified because that would like save so many lives. But it's kind of like a decision that I would make not from blame, not from, from hate. You know, because hate is a very um, unpleasant emotion. It's very, you know, it's, um, it's a vile emotion. Um, so sometimes the, what I'm trying to present here is that, you know, abandoning the, um, the illusion of free will doesn't mean that we're going to abandon morality and we're going to abandon um, what's right, what needs to be done. But we can do it from a more understanding perspective. And as a matter of fact, you know, if 
if we treated um, criminals, people like Gaddafi, with perhaps less hatred, uh, more understanding, then um, that might be, um, if our world was, was structured that way, then people like that might not do the heinous things that they do. Um, for example, in police, in police work a lot of times, there's this strategy of good cop, bad cop. You know, um, the good cop being understanding, just like, you know, kind of empathizing with the, with the suspect or criminal or something, just like basically taking a causal rather than a free will perspective. And often it, the people find that when, when people, you know, are addressed in that way, their defenses um, are lowered. You know, they don't feel, they, they say to themselves, hey, this person really isn't blaming me. This person understands my predicament. I can trust him. I can you know, reveal whatever, or I can, you know, admit to whatever. So, um, okay, so um, again, there's this, this question is very important to both our everyday lives and um, the structure of our civilization, our society, our, our, our world. Um, I hope you, you know, have a better understanding of how the hedonic imperative and, you know, our always seeking pleasure and avoiding pain makes free will impossible. In, in, in the future, we're going to explore other ways, other ways of understanding how, <laughs> how um, our, our wills are not free. And I'm laughing because sometimes I get, tend to get too serious with this stuff. And, um, and my own pleasure imperative um, reminds me that, that, you know, I should be having a bit more fun. All right. Remember to catch our shows at causalconsciousness.com, and uh, we'll see you again soon.